This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. This is a uh, Cello Chat with Joshua Roman. And could you please give a short introduction of who you are uh, to everyone who might not know? Yes, thank you, thank Jeremy. You. Uh, I'm Joshua Roman. I'm a cellist. Generally, I uh, work as a soloist, um, playing concertos, do some recitals. I do a lot of collaborations, um, both inside and outside of classical music and also music in general, um, including a lot of work with TED through, uh, you know, TED Talks. So I was a, became a TED fellow in 2011 and a TED senior fellow not long after that. So a lot of different kinds of um, collaborations throughout the years with dancers and actors and even sometimes speakers and business people. And I think a lot of people on the internet uh, found me over 10 years ago, I did a, a thing called the Popper Project where I recorded all 40 of the Popper etudes on video and posted them on YouTube. So um, I guess that's me in a nutshell. I love to play programs that are full of music that feels meaningful to me. And uh, that, that means that there's some sort of personal connection and that ends up being a lot of a lot of programs that have a through line that's not necessarily style. So it'll mix, mix styles, but have uh, a different kind of through line. So yeah, I'd say that's me in a nutshell, <laughs> musically. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so we have our first question is asked by our partners and friends at Together With Classical. If you had to introduce classical music to someone for the first time, how would you do it? And what piece would you suggest? Oh man, that's a great question. You know, I actually, I do a fairly often introduce people to classical music with different pieces. The most important thing for me is that it's something that the performer is very passionate about and that that passion comes through um, in the music and that the setting is a setting that's comfortable to the person who's listening. Um, more than which piece of music, I feel that those other things are the important parts of the introduction. So somebody who's really able to relax and be open um, in the audience, and that's through the setting and the presentation of the performance. And then for the performer, music that they care about so much that it's just obvious to anyone who is listening. Thank you so much. Uh, here's another question. Uh, what is on your music stand right now? <laughs> um, what is, oh, Eka by uh, James Lee III. It's a lament, a beautiful lament for cello and piano. Um, do you know James Lee III? Uh, I personally don't. Uh, I think okay. a lot of people might not know, so. Yeah, uh, he's a composer in the Baltimore area and I was introduced to his music by um, Thomas Wilkins, the, the, direct, the conductor, he used to be music director of the Omaha Symphony, um, where I've worked with him quite a few times. And yeah, I have exciting news for another time um, about James, uh, but he writes really thoughtful, beautiful music that takes its inspiration from a lot of historical research and music and cultural influences, especially in America, maybe the Americas, but especially in the United States. And he puts it all together, all of his influences in a, in a way that feels somehow simultaneously unique, but also 
evocative of um, things that are familiar. So uh, I love that mix. And yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I noticed that you have a bunch of performances coming up. Could you tell us anything about any exciting projects or performances that you'd like to share? Yes. So actually, the part of the reason that I thought it would be good to talk about managing practice is that I'm having to do that right now. You know, I um, when I first this this actually when I first started the Popper Project, the reason I started doing it, recording at the beginning, it was one etude every week. The reason I started doing that was that I felt, I felt like I needed a weekly marker of progress. After years and years of school, and then for two years I was the principal cellist of the Seattle Symphony where we had concerts almost every week. After all of that time, um, with that structure, it was very difficult to have a period of several months open with nothing and then to suddenly have, let's say, there were times when I would have like five programs in three weeks of different things, concertos, recitals, all mixed together, and I didn't have the practicing discipline and structure to help me understand how to manage that, and so I would, I decided to start doing popper etudes so that I'd had something week to week to measure that kind of progress by and wasn't just subject to the the road schedule which was very weird especially that first year of of solo solo work so right now i'm dealing with a little bit of that for other reasons coming out of the pandemic also i have health challenges now um, that i am managing and it's taught me so much um, but it's right there going back to some of those lessons about prioritizing and scheduling. So in starting in mid-April, I have six weeks um, in a row of different programs. I'm doing Don Quixote with the St. Louis Symphony. The next week I go to the Clyburn um, in Fort Worth. The Clyburn Competition also does concerts. They have a very cool concert series, so I'm playing a, a full recital there with piano. And then the next night I'm doing a solo program for them um, at, a, at a like hip venue. I don't know what we're supposed to say now instead of hip. I think hip is kind of old, but whatever. Hip venue. And then the next week, I don't think I'm allowed to say yet where somehow, but I'm playing Dvorak somewhere. The following week, I'm doing uh, Saint-Saëns in Wisconsin and another piece. And then the next week, I'm doing the Brahms Double with Simone Porter in Jacksonville, Florida. And then the last week I'm coming back home to New York and playing John Tavner's The Protecting Veil. And that concert hasn't been announced yet. It's getting announced tomorrow, um, which is really exciting. So that's six weeks in a row of different rep. And on top of that, I am preparing my first American album. It's far too late uh, to be <laughs> doing that, but I'm doing it now. And that's a, a lot of work. So that's gonna be recorded either right before that six week starts or a week after the end of it. And I've had a, a, a week to bring it back. Um, and that's quite an endeavor. So all of that right now is what I'm preparing as I'm at home uh, with time, trying to make sure that when I'm on the road and when I'm going back and forth between home and performances, that I'm not scrambling to get ready for all of that. Wow, yeah, you got a lot on your plate. Um, so you have you have all this repertoire uh, that you had to juggle. So what's your strategy for um, you know, tackling each one? And you have like a new new concert each week. So how do you how do you handle that? Well, one of the things that is helpful for me at this point is that I've played almost all of these before. No, I've played all of these before. Yeah, I've played, except for some of the recital program um, for the Clyburn, some of that is, is music like Eka by James Lee III, perfect example. That's a piece I've never played before. Everything else, um, aside from a few pieces on that program, is um, familiar to a certain degree. So my strategy luckily can be a little more easy than it would if I were learning a lot more new music, but it would be basically the same 
in any case, which is to try to make sure that when a big period of performing starts, that all of the music is solid enough that I feel like I'm just bringing things back and um, keeping them, how do you say, it? keeping them warm or polishing as I go rather than trying to learn as I go, because that feels more panicky. That was great. Uh, we have a question from YouTube from Ji Hoon. I always yeah. ask uh, why you decided to leave the Seattle Symphony. It amazes me that you got the job at such a young age. Ah, yes, thank you for joining us. And yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was 22 when I got that job. And the truth is that I always wanted to do what I do now. And I had, had tried some competitions. I was starting to do well, but was learning the reality of competitions through watching friends win them and have a career for a year or maybe two years and then see it fizzle out and do nothing. And I realized it wasn't just about that. It was about so much more. So I decided instead of sticking to the competition route to do things a different way, and that's actually why I auditioned for the Seattle Symphony and I had several other orchestras I was going to audition for if I hadn't won that. And, um, so the plan was never to stay, and that was understood from the day of the audition. And they were very gracious to support me in that, and I had a wonderful time playing all of that music and learning from my colleagues, and I felt very supported as a principal, even at that young age. And it was the thing is, it was never a matter of if, it was always a matter of when. And so the timing was much faster than I thought it would be. I thought I'd stay for five years, but I got enough concerts lined up um, that it became obvious it would be problematic between my responsibilities as a, as a principal cellist, which I was already taking time off to go do other things, and the opportunity of, of, of being a soloist and following my passion and dream. And so the timing was just when that balance became obviously, uh, this is the moment you have to go. So it was never, my intention to stay and I learned a lot and was very grateful for their support in that. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really great answer. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe move the microphone a little bit closer. I will move closer to the microphone. Okay. I think that's better. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. All right. So it becomes a problem again. Yeah. So from your transition from uh, the Seattle Symphony to the professional world where you're performing uh, um, constantly. How do you find that uh, transition from orchestral music to solo music um, uh, different? Yeah. And like, what are the kind of challenges for each? That's a great question that uh, hits like a lot of topics. So everything from how you manage your life and, and your life balance to how you manage learning music and uh, finding creativity in your in your job all of those are a part of it and so I, I think I will focus in on the practicing element um, and just say like I've learned similar things in both arenas um, you know, unfortunately, I like had to relearn them, even though I could have, if I were uh, maybe wiser, I could have stuck with one lesson. But I'll give an example. When I was in the Seattle Symphony, I learned after a while that even for like stuff with very easy cello parts, like sight readable, uh, Mozart, sometimes or Haydn where you know you're chugging along playing the bass line like one note at a time for a measure and even that if I didn't take the time to go through everything and physically and mentally feel prepared to perform it then and I let that happen in the rehearsals I would start to feel discombobulated discombobulated physically I would start to feel things get tight and stuck um, I would feel uh, tensions creep in where they shouldn't and start to cause problems. And so I realized very early the importance, maybe not early enough, but pretty quickly, the, the importance of really making sure to take the music 
seriously, even if it was easy, if, even if I felt like the job was going to be easy, even sometimes, even in the two years I was there, we would repeat a piece a few months or a year, a season later for whatever reason on a different series. But I still had to go back and treat it as if there was something fresh in order to feel fresh and to feel not only physically set, but also invested in the music and excited about it. So making sure to have the ritual of practice be important, even for things that were easy, is something I learned in the Seattle Symphony for orchestral music. Weirdly, I had to relearn that lesson um, in the first couple of years of coming out, leaving the orchestra and becoming a soloist. And it's a specific piece, the Tchaikovsky Rococo Variations, for whatever reason, I was playing it all the time. And I, and I would like, you know, I'd practice it, but, but I would like often show up. I knew this piece, I played it so many times at a certain point, I would show up not really like practicing it as if I'd never played it. I like trusted that I knew it. So I'd play it, like run through it and then go on stage for the rehearsal. And I remember this one performance where it just felt messy. It just felt kind of gross to me. Not, not, not technically, but like musically. Technically, it was totally fine. It was all there. But musically, I was feeling disconnected. And I was very like puzzled. Why is this happening? I was feeling maybe a little bit of the physical stuff. And so I started actually practicing again. Um, as if, not just practicing, was practicing, but practicing as if I didn't know it, um, as, as if I had to start over a little bit. And not that I had to do everything, as in like have to relearn the piece. What I mean is that I looked at the score, I went through it carefully, not just relying on what I knew from before, but seeing if anything new came up. And really, a lot, not a lot of new stuff came up, but my attitude, the attitude that I brought to practicing it, changed completely how I felt on stage with rehearsals and the performances. I felt so much more excited about the piece, about what I was saying. It didn't feel like a repeat of something that I had already done. It felt like a fresh thing. And again, I don't know that I actually found that much new stuff. I might have found some new things, but mostly it was my attitude because I was treating the moment as an important moment worthy of focusing in that way. So the parallel between orchestral and solo um, preparation for me was that in order not to start to have issues creep in, that often they don't start physically. Sometimes they start physically. Sometimes it starts with our attitude and the kind of, kind of attention we're paying and, and how much we care about it, which informs how we hold ourselves. So I needed to treat even things that felt very simple or repetitive, treat them with some kind of integrity and respect um, even if it didn't even if it felt like it was going to be easy and that would set my body and my mind and my attitude in a way that would bring the most out of it and for me be more fulfilling it's true in orchestral true in solo probably also very true in chamber music yeah thank you so much for your answer i think it's really uh, insightful for uh, many professional musicians who have to often repeat the same piece over and over. So how can you make sure that you approach it in a, in a way that's like fresh, new, and what kind of attitude? And I think that's really helpful. Um, so we have another question from Ji Hoon. Uh, she asks, uh, just for my curiosity as a student, how do you make a living as a soloist? I know you get a contract when you're with a symphony, but as a soloist, do you make a normal salary? Thank you, Jenshu. That's a that's a good question. Down to the details, um, it's it's pretty it's pretty hard. I mean, you're out there on your own. You have a manager. Uh, well, I mean, some people. I have a manager. Um, you may work with a publicist, and there's there's money there's money to be paid, and it's it's a matter of it's a matter of growing your reputation, um, of being consistent, of uh, growing your salary as the business grows because it's a business and in an orchestra you, you don't necessarily a lot of people do actually have to deal with a lot of the business but you don't necessarily have to deal with the totality of the business in the way that some members of the orchestra committee or um, the administration and the board might and my organization is very small it's me and the people that work 
technically work for me, um, which is just so weird. But that is something that you have to consider the growth of as well. So the money that you make from a concert is not all going to you. You're, it's a business and it goes to different people. And it can be more lucrative than uh, a lot of principal positions. But I think also it can be scary maybe because um, it's, it all depends on what people ask you to do next year. And it can vary so wildly. When I was in the Seattle Symphony, I got the same check every couple of weeks. Um, but now if I have a month where I don't perform, I don't get paid that month. And so um, luckily I might have several concerts the month before, the month after, and maybe I'm specifically, as I do now, taking time to work on projects that will pay off later and using money from previous concerts kind of as that buffer. So it evens out over time and maybe even can be potentially better, but it is, it's a, it's a business, you're running a small business, and there's a lot that has to be considered or um, taken care of, even if it's not by you, if it's by your team. So it's the, you know, it can be great and it can be bad, it just changes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to also ask, uh, so since you, as a soloist, you have to basically run your own business, uh, where did you learn how to do it? Was it just kind of like you can learn as you go, or do you have help from other people, or, or, or yeah, what, what is it like? That's such a great question as well. Unfortunately, um, most of it is learning as you go, which means that the mistakes um, can cost. And that's not great some people have mentors that have done it before that take them under their wing i've had a little bit of that occasionally which has been very helpful when it happens some people have managers that do more or less and there are advantages and disadvantages to that and um and that's another thing that you have to learn is like as you're building your team and where you're getting your where you're getting your information and planning from um what is that going to do in terms of taking things off your plate, which is something that can feel really nice um, and free up room for other things versus taking creative decisions and control away, which can be detrimental to developing your artistic voice and turn it into something that really feels like a business instead of an artistic endeavor. And it should always be fueled by passion and artistry. So that can be dangerous as just as dangerous as, as, as not making any money, <laughs> maybe even more dangerous, who knows. Um, so unfortunately, I've had to learn a lot as I, I go along, but there are programs that have helped me occasionally um, and blogs out there, like I think there's one called Ask Edna that Edna Landau runs, and there's a book, uh, Beyond Talent by Angela Miles Beeching, and a lot of these resources can be helpful. Um, it's just difficult because there, compared to other other ways of being a musician, there aren't that many soloists, and a lot don't really talk about how it works, and so it's difficult to know what to do. So there's a lot of a lot of learning on the go. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, thank you for your insight. Uh, we have a question from Jane from Facebook. Uh, my grandson loves the cello. He is two and a half years old now. And what age could he start? Is it detrimental to start too soon? Oh, that's so sweet. You know, I started when I was three. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I don't, I think if a kid loves an instrument and they are going to end up doing it anyway, it doesn't hurt to give them uh, a start. I think the, for me, the most important thing is to find teachers who focus on the child's relationship with the instrument that it's positive, that it's fun, that it's creative, that it's not just about the structure and the structure is so important. You gotta like learn the basics if it's something that you love and you wanna progress in. But at the same time, if you're not constantly fueling your own creative interest in it, then eventually you might be separated from the reason you loved it in the first place. And I see that happen to so many of us and it's, it's, it's difficult, to, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to come back from so, so a teacher who really inspires joy, who's game for whatever the, the child is interested in and creative at finding ways to make sure that progression of technique also happens. Although I would say at two and a half, it's more about 
uh, or three even, it's more about making sure that you're not taught wrong things than that you go quickly. You don't need to like progress too quickly. Just as long as you're not learning things that will hurt you physically or damage your relationship to the instrument, then you're great. So fun, loving teachers who have a pretty good setup and whose students seem like they really like what they're doing um, later, that's what I would look for. And I don't think there's such thing as too early. Perfect. Uh, I think you previously alluded to the physical aspects of being a cello professional. And we have a question uh, from Danny from Facebook. Uh, how do you deal with mental and physical fatigue when practicing, also injuries in general? I've noticed you've worked with Alexander Technique teachers. Yes, Danny, thank you for the question. Um, I actually started working with an Alexander Technique teacher in May of 2021, Lori Schiff. She's incredible. She also teaches at Juilliard. And I've learned so much from her in the past almost two years. I started with two lessons a week and then um, I've been doing sticking to kind of one a week unless I'm on the road or something ever since then. And I've learned so much from Lori, not just about when playing the cello, but I initially started going because of a condition that I have now called long COVID. I won't go into all of that at the moment, but um, it is Alexander Technique has helped me in all parts of my physical existence and even I think in ease of other emotional and mental sorts. With practicing, even before that though, I think I started to pick up on a few things that um, first of all, having an intention and setting limits is important and that can be difficult when you feel like you have a lot on your plate. Um, so one thing that I have done, and it's, it's just this shift that I had to learn how to do, is to limit my practicing to um, 45 minutes a session. And occasionally I would let myself go to an hour, but I noticed, and this took a while to transition and to be okay with that. I had so much like angst and anxiety, be, anxiety about changing, practicing a lot at once, because that's just kind of how I did it. But as I got used to it, I did notice that I was more effective in my practicing because I had better energy even if that meant stopping in the middle of something at 45 minutes. I put the phone on airplane mode, I set a timer, and I practice, and at the end of that, I stop and I take a break. Um, and it just helps clarify not only what you're doing while you're doing it, but it also helps me think of how I'm going to practice and to come to the cello with more of a plan. And that's not to say that I make a checklist and I'm, I'm like robotic about just sticking to that. Sometimes my plan is just to pick up the cello and improvise or see what happens for a while. But I almost never walk into a practice session not having some idea of what I want. And not to say that doesn't change during a practice session. Of course it changes. But um, to come to the cello almost with that respect of like, what am I going to do with my time with you as a cello? How are we going to spend our time together? And that helps me plan better, maximize, pay attention to what's working, what's not working. And those, I think, are the most important things for creating that structure and within that structure where you can be creative about what you do and, and what you notice. The first step is setting boundaries and setting limits for you to play in and then and then be creative and see what works. Much. Uh, do you have any tips for specific chairs or cushions or any anything of that kind of sort? Yeah, I mean I'm in a I'm in the cello chair right there. I love the cello chair, but it works for my height. So I think they might have different heights. I think um, like a lot of people, uh, it's fine. You kind of just have to f work with what works for you. There are some principles that I think are important regardless, like something that doesn't slope back, something that slopes, if anything, slightly forward and that you um, are sitting towards the front of the chair, uh, I've learned a lot from Alexander Technique about how to focus on my body and what I'm sitting, but I would also say that I learned a lot from yoga. I learned a lot from any in aware engagement with my body, working out, even running. Um, it's very important to think of, 
to take care of your body just as a human being. But as a cellist, also it's important to have body awareness. So anything that you do outside of your practicing that helps you physically feel good and be aware of your body is going to help your practicing in the same way because you're going to be able to notice those things too. Great. Um, we have a, another question from Jihoon. Uh, uh, this is unrelated to the video, but I wanted to ask where you found Midge and have you how you first felt about her. I saw a lot of your old videos and loved the sound. Aw, oh, thank you. Yeah, Midge, um, I'll pull Midge into frame. Midge is, a, is my cello. Uh, Midge was made in 1899 by Giulio Degani, the son of Eugenio Degani, and he was in his early 20s when he made Midge. Um, some of you have commented on, uh, I don't know about some of you who are watching, but people have commented on the, the narrow bouts, uh, which is, is true that they're a bit narrow. Um, weirdly, the, the cello itself is actually so tall that I had to buy a new case uh, because the cello didn't fit. So it's not it's not overall that much smaller. In some ways, it's taller, but I'm a tall guy, so it looks smaller. Plus, it's it's narrow, especially on the side. So it's, it's a little deceiving, um, but also not the biggest of cellos. Definitely not a Montagnana model. <laughs> anyway, I found Midge in Chicago. This very generous couple um, wanted to buy a, a cello for me to use. Um, and sent me looking for cellos and I tried a few over the course of months and I would take them on the road for my concertos and, and recitals and then I came back and uh, one day and, and was switching out a cello and this Degani Midge was, wasn't, I didn't know it was Midge at the time, but this Degani was there and immediately there was a connection. I heard something in the sound and it was just you know, I don't know if Midge is the greatest cello ever. Um, I love Midge, and she serves me well, and especially for the price range, which I didn't know what the price range was, but she stuck out as being punching far above her weight. So they bought the cello. I'm super lucky. If you have people who are supporting you in your musical life, don't take them for granted. Um, it's so important, and we're so lucky and uh, to have that. So that's how Midge came into my life, and... It's a relationship that continues to grow and new things unfold all the time. So. Oh, that's a really great story. Um, uh, Zach has a question. Uh, I've developed some rotator cuff injury. I've never heard of Alexander technique. Could you give me like the top level principles? Sounds like a question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Like how do you explain Alexander technique? I will say that that is um, I will I will tell you some of the principles, um, but I would also say don't trust me because it's very important with Alexander Technique to work with an actual teacher because um, one of the big principles is understanding your body awareness. So if I say something or if I, I hear something, if I hear a principle like this needs to be over here, you need to feel this working with somebody who really knows the body and can see these things and understands the mechanisms um, and can help move it to the right place is so important because what I feel may actually be different than what's going on because we're subject to uh, so many tensions that we're not aware of. Um, so working on body awareness, first of all, is a very important principle of Alexander Technique and that happens working directly with an Alexander teacher who is moving things and helping you feel what it feels like when something is actually free, which can often be surprisingly different than what you feel is free. It's another level that almost can be scary sometimes until you learn to trust it. And then as you do, um, great things open up. And that's one of the, the big things about Alexander Technique is leaving things uh, keeping things from engaging in tension unnecessarily. So not, for example, squeezing the neck. When you squeeze the neck and the head comes down and goes forward, so much of us do a lot of this uh, with our screens and with our screens and with the cello, et cetera. But if you 
if you just release the muscles in the neck, and again, this is really hard to, to, to fully do without help. So you can try it, but don't expect everything to, to totally just work. As you release, the head actually comes up and you start to feel that the top of the spine is, is, is around here. It's not down here, it's up here. That's where your head is rotating from. And that all of those muscles back there can just let go. And then your head starts to almost float and then maybe even tilt forward just the slightest bit up here in the in the skull and so this idea of letting things be as released as possible um, so that there is natural length um, and the tension is distributed because there's no such thing as no tension otherwise you're laying on the ground probably dead um, but letting the tension be distributed where it's actually effective instead of having habitual squeezing take place. So keeping yourself, it's called inhibiting. So inhibiting these habitual tensions uh, is a big principle of Alexander Technique. I'm gonna stop there because I'm just like butcher more of it, but I highly encourage you if you're interested to find an Alexander teacher and take a lesson um, because I had even read a couple of books on Alexander Technique and felt like it helped, but the difference between reading, and I'm, I feel like I'm you know, smart enough to apply things and self-aware, but the difference between applying things from reading a couple books and going to one lesson with Lori uh, was night and day. So go take a lesson if you can, um, is my encouragement to you. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, I have a question about practicing. You previously alluded that you your practice sessions usually last between 45 to minutes to one hour. I was wondering how your practice uh, has changed from when you were a student to when you were preparing for the Seattle Symphony audition to when you were in the orchestra and to when you were a soloist and now. Yes, the evolution of practice over somebody's lifetime can be a very interesting thing. Thank you for that question. It's, um, yeah, I mean, when I was a, a kid, very young, I just loved playing the cello and I would practice. And then, of course, you know, at a certain point when I was like 12 or whatever, going through my preteen rebellion um, somehow cello got mixed up in that for a while, but it ended pretty quick because I actually loved the cello. I just didn't want to be told what to do. Um, but after that, it was pretty much self-motivated, and I would just practice as much as I could. When I was about 13, 14, sometimes I would practice five hours in a day. If I had time, I was practicing, and I was trying to just spend – I just figured if I spent as much time as possible, I would be um, – I would be absorbing all of that and progressing more than if I spent less time. And I think I carried that same attitude into conservatory. And if my teacher said something, I would take it so seriously. I would like, you know, if he said practice circles with the bow in the mirror for six hours, I would take it literally and I would go six hours and I'd be like, well, I don't, why not do eight? Um, and just spend so much time playing the cello and you know, I would sometimes like try to make sure that I was being effective about it. But in general, my attitude was more time equals more better. <laughs> more time equals more better. Yeah, right. Um, so then in the symphony, um, I went through some things as I started dealing with, you know, the story I told earlier about um, making sure that I was practicing things that even were easy just so that I had the right attitude when it showed up on stage. And that started to, to drastically shift. I guess even preparing for that audition was a shift in my practicing because I didn't practice that much. Um, in fact, for much of the year before I took the Seattle Symphony audition, I left the cello in the corner and would practice barely at all each week. But I would think about music a lot and I thought about my approach a lot. And I would pick up the cello. Every time I picked up the cello, there was a lot of intention. So I guess that was an important phase. Um, in the Seattle Symphony, yeah, it was mostly just about making sure that I was keeping that intention and respect every time I picked up the cello and making sure that it was already there when I 
was interacting with other musicians or performing as well. And I went through some ups and downs with that. It was hard. Coming out of that into the soloist life, um, I really started leaning on things that I had learned before in terms of how to prepare for performances. And every once in a while, like with the Popper Project, I would also throw something in there that would have nothing to do with performances just to have something that's for myself and for for my relationship with the cello outside of what I give to other people. I, I didn't intend for the Popper Project to get views. It's been pretty cool to see people um, follow it and, and learn from it. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And now I embrace that. At the beginning, it was just a way to, to force me to practice um, and to do that for myself rather than for others for performances. So that was a lesson too. And now I have a mix of things. Now I try to, to make sure that I'm feeling good before I get to a performance. And so it's all about building trust. And this is a theme that, that I watched occasionally pop up um, as I was younger, but now is, now is just baked in. Practicing for me is about developing that relationship with the instrument and the trust that that relationship is solid. And that can mean so many different things when it comes to technique, uh, musicality, creativity, um, passion, all of those things are in that mix. And so practicing is about finding the right balance with the instrument and then the instrument with your life to make sure that it's a positive thing that you play music because that's why we do it. And uh, sometimes that can mean practicing less and just being more focused when you practice and spending more time thinking about music away from the cello. Whatever, wherever you are, um, finding the things, wherever you are with, with the more or less, and it can change even for one person, finding a way to relate to the instrument in a very positive way and to always be developing that sense of trust and joy. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Angela. Uh, what would you say to an 11 or 12 year old who says, I just practice what I feel like practicing and I usually skip some of the things my teacher assigns? Ah. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Angela. Um, this is a question I actually get a lot. Uh, I don't know if that's funny or not. I think it's funny. But I'm all about if you're interested in something, do it. Um, however, I'm also all about trusting your teacher and doing everything that they say. So what I would say is absolutely, you need to practice what you feel like practicing because that's why you play this instrument. At the same time, you need to trust your teacher to help give you tools that are gonna make you better at what you do and you'll have so much more uh, ability to explore and be creative if you stick with their program as well. So it's not one or the other, it's both. Make sure you're staying on track with what your teacher teaches you and also feed your joy for the instrument by doing the things that you want to do. Um, and if that's a real conflict with your teacher, then maybe you and your, your parent, uh, parents, parents need to talk about the approach that the teacher has. Um, but I do believe that there needs to be room for that creativity and that self um, exploration alongside something that has a, a technical uh, pr and musical progression so that you can keep developing and finding new ways to explore your voice. What a, what a really great answer. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, musicality and uh, deepening your uh, uh, creativity in that regard. Because uh, a lot of times uh, I think technique is relatively easy to figure out what the next step is because it's very subjective. You can't do something and go to your teacher and you develop that technique and you will really do it. But for musical creativity, it's a lot more difficult because it's you're trying to get to something that you can't even imagine uh, currently. So how, what is your process for deepening your own uh, music experience? I love this question and it's something that I'm still exploring. There are um, 
And it's so important. It's so important to be developing that language and to not just take it for granted and not just expect it to turn on uh, when you're playing in front of people or to to just be a part of you already. Just like language, we don't start out knowing which words to accent or which words to use in a sentence or which syllables to bring out to accent. Um, that is something that we pick up along the way. And, and we're taught that too um, in school and by the people around us, even if it's informal. So paying attention to that progression just as much and, and and I would argue that it's even more important than than technique because technique is the how um, technique is the the way that you do that it's not just the the it's not the thing it's the way that you do it and there are interesting this is reading Feuermann's biography a while back by Moreau um, Emmanuel Feuermann talking about these um, these these players or these schools that he had seen these schools of cello playing where uh, it would be so wildly different and some of them were focused on technique first and then some of them were so philosophical uh and all about just like what does it mean what are you trying to say that they wouldn't get to the technique and he would hear this like awful performance that was supposedly revelatory because of what was behind it so balancing these out and exploring these is very important and i think the the very first thing for me is paying attention to what makes you excited and what moves you and then asking yourself why and paying attention to the the differences in in different performances and and studying that just in the way that you would approach learning how to shift what about a phrase? What about sustaining tension? What do you love about a performance beyond just the sound? But can you can you actually articulate more about that? Do you pay attention to the way somebody uses their vibrato? Um, not just is it fast or slow, is it all the time or not, but like what do they do when they're creating more tension um, at the top of a phrase? What, what do they do at the bottom of a phrase? Can, can you actually notice and articulate the differences in tone? And the more that you start to just be aware of that, the more you will notice and start to hear that in your own playing and to emulate the practices that um, make a, a big impression on you that you love. And you probably won't end up I mean, I, I don't think I do. You probably won't end up sounding just like them because you're going, the more you explore that, the more you find your own voice and the more you find what you like. Um, but you can have models that you learn from just the way that we look at someone's arm and say, that's, that's really relaxed. How do I learn to be relaxed like that? I think that's the very first thing is just making that awareness a big part of how you approach your musical ear um, in the first place. And then in practicing, it's all about trying things and seeing how it feels. Um, and there are some very basic principles that I think can be good frameworks. They're not rules, they're frameworks for, for hearing. One of those is, is something, I'll just give an example of one. It's called, I, I think of it as like natural melodic phrasing, which is that when uh, something rises in pitch, it also rises in volume. And when it gets lower in pitch, it gets lower in volume. Now, it's very basic. It's um, oversimplified, but it's what the voice does naturally. It's what a lot of instruments kind of do naturally too, some, some of them, a lot of them. And this is a very natural sort of thing. And a, and a lot of music plays on this and has a rise to a climax and then a fall away from a climax or something like that, both in volume and in pitch and intensity, all of those things. Once you start looking at things with that framework, you'll also see when choices are made to do the opposite or to like wait a while for that, to delay it or to enhance it. And all of a sudden, you have a way of relating to very different kinds of musical approaches from different performers or different composers that 
you can begin to understand and develop your own feelings about. So um, that's just one example of a framework for listening to and understanding on a very basic level music musicality that can be developed to whatever degree of nuance you're, you want to take it. Um, but I would say that's a great place to start is developing that kind of awareness, having a framework for that awareness, and and then playing around with it is the, the last thing that I'll say is just playing around with it, not only by practicing practicing different things, but just by finding ways to bring music that you love into your practicing, whether that's playing along with music that you listen to that's not classical. I absolutely encourage that creating your own arrangements of, of things that you really love if it's not existing. Just do it. And you don't have to do it for other people. Do it for yourself. Um, and improvising. Improvising doesn't have to be complicated. Just what do you like? Do you like repetitive things? Do you like scalar things? Just explore that. Give yourself as much framework and awareness as possible. And your voice will start to develop. Thank you so much for your answer. I think the awareness is very important and uh, very helpful for uh, any choice, any age, really. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what kind of interdisciplinary or like uh, or other genres of music or uh, different disciplines do you, do you look to for inspiration? I I love everything. I mean, I love um stories i love stories so that can be uh lyrics in a song that can be um reading that can be um tv <laughs> and i'm such a if i go on a tv binge for a while or like binge watch some show um it's it's kind of nerdy because i you know i like just watch a show sure but I, I, I always also have this part of me that's like really trying to understand the dynamics and the rhythm of things and, and not necessarily immediately in a musical way, just like in, in the way that it is and to really love everything about the art that it is. And then I get inspired um, if I think something, something is excellent and creative and particularly moving or whatever it is, then I'm like, ooh, how do I learn from that? Is that something that sometimes I can like I can like pick up a, a nugget of something that applies to, to what I'm doing in terms of the timing or the the approach and sometimes sometimes not sometimes it's just I see that that person is fully being themselves and so that inspires me to more fully find my voice and communicate that not to not to be like them but to be more like me um yeah, stories are, are I'd, say, I'd say, the biggest thing. Being around anyone creative is inspiring. And, and when I'm around people that maybe aren't as creative and inspired, like, I'm like, well, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> so, so I, you know, that's inspiring, too. I would say whatever you're interested in, you don't have to go out and cultivate an interest in things that you don't care about. I think you can, and that's not bad, but I would start with finding links for the things that you already really like, like just ask questions. Why do I really like this? Um, how does this inspire me in what I'm doing? And see where it goes. Uh, Richard has a question. Uh, how do you avoid burnout? Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the question. Burnout is real. Um, I think the very first thing, again, just like practicing effectively is setting limits and setting boundaries and that can be hard because um for a lot of reasons i think there's the, there's this like intrinsic reason of, of wanting to think that you can do so many things as a human being but also specifically in music there are other layers there's not knowing like job security and this is this is different for each variation but i think it applies for the most part across the board to musicians is like wanting to simultaneously feel creative and also uh, to, to make a living. So that can lead to decisions that are, are not necessarily based on taking care of yourself and 
I've been I've been victim of that in the past, and I'm really working hard now to make sure that I don't fall prey to um, anxiety and fear about what's coming up, and instead I, I say no to things that I don't really feel compelled by. Um, I'm not going to deliver what I should for those things. Somebody else is probably more suited, and it's going to keep me from being able to focus on the things that are really important to me. So that's the first thing, but it's still hard not to just do too much. So building a team, knowing who's on your team, and that's not just people that you work with, that's people in your life that support you in any way. Um, And for me, it's also important to make sure that rest is a part of that, that rest is counted in the planning, not just something that's assumed, um, but that breaks on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and in, in the year, that those are all planned and part of it. And that can be really hard, but uh, and it can take a long time to start to really trust that, but developing that trust is so important. And um, yeah. It may happen anyway, but those are the tools. Thank you so much for the tips. Um, I want to ask you a question. Uh, What do you think is the direction of classical music for the future? Yeah, oh man. Well, I don't know, but I can tell you that I see more and more, um, and I bet a lot of people on this have uh, seen more and more new music Um, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, more people composing and performing, more crossover. Um, And what's interesting to me is that if you take those basic truths, and we'll set aside some of the other things that are are very important that are, are being addressed in some ways, like inequality, and there's stuff that's not being addressed that's important too, um, how is that showing up in, in our industry in classical music? But if you set, if you focus on like what musicians are doing um, and what music is being created, there's more and more overlap with how it was before the 20th century, where musical life was not quite so siloed. Um, where you had Johannes Brahms, uh, one of the biggest composers of his time, going around playing tours of um, nomadic music. I I forget the term that's not gypsy, um, apologies. Uh, But music that's not, it wasn't classical music. And he would do tours of this, and that was like totally normal. name a composer for me before the 20th century that wasn't also a performer, minus Robert Schumann who hurt his hand and couldn't. Um, These things had so much overlap, creative life and and performance life weren't quite so separate. You had people who were better at one than the other, of course, but like the training and the, the expectation was that creativity was a more a part of a performer's life and vice versa. Um, And I think it's good that we're returning to that because I think that it it keeps us more in tune with the world around us. And I hope that that's a direction that continues and that we let go maybe a little bit of some of the the need for superstars who are just better. Um, Even though I want to (laughs) be, of course I want to be the best I can and be known for that. But but I want to focus first and foremost on creativity and doing something that feels meaningful, personal, and connects with other people um, and that I feel love and joy and and, uh, awareness through. So hopefully that's happening more and more. Yeah, um, I noticed that you also have your own compositions and I was wondering if you could talk about the process of uh, getting into composing, and uh, what what would you say to students who might be somewhat interested in this field but are very intimidated by the idea? 
two great questions. Um, yeah, I was not trained as a composer, so I'll start. I'll just tell my story um, quickly because it, it's kind of a long story. But um, the shortest version of my story, skipping a few things, is that I wasn't trained as a composer. I'd have like one lesson, maybe two lessons with a friend. Uh, it was not that serious. And I always thought that it would be fun someday, but I didn't really do it. And I was working on a collaboration with this wonderful actor, Anna Devere Smith. She's a, such a dear friend um, now. And we were introduced by Michael Tilson Thomas, the former music director of the San Francisco Symphony. And she was doing a stage work and wanted to work with a musician on stage, somebody else on stage for the first time. And as we were working through it, I initially started out using music from Bach. Um, and we were both like in agreement about that. And at a certain point I felt, started to feel weird because timings wouldn't work. And there would be like, I, I wanted to play for like six minutes, but I wanted it to be from this mood to this mood. And in order to accomplish that, I would have to like rearrange parts of Bach and make it longer or sometimes cut it shorter. I felt really weird about doing that. And, I, and Anna agreed, let's not do that. So instead I sent her all of the solo cello recordings I could find, um, like Crumb, Ligeti, Kodai, pieces my friends had written, all, all of this stuff, and she dutifully listened to it, and we got together the next meeting we had about this project, and there was this moment we were working on, and I was li using Ligeti, actually. I was using part of Ligeti, and I was like, this, this is close, uh, but it's just not quite there, and she's like, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's not exactly the tone we're looking for um and i was so frustrated and i and i grabbed my cello and i just busted out with this thing i already had my cello I, but I, I busted out with this thing and it's like we want something that sounds like this and she said yes that's do that one why don't you play that one and i was like oh i'm sorry that's not actually a piece i was just showing the kind of piece that we want to look for and she was like i don't understand what are you saying you just did it do it again and I was like, no, 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 but it's, I, I can, but we need actual music, not just like, and as I was trying to argue about this, I was realizing how silly it was that actually what I had just done was compose a snippet of what we needed. And that these barriers are so arbitrary um, once you start letting yourself be expressive and creative that it turns into composing and that's what happened i ended up composing about 45 minutes of music for this theater uh project that we put on in several really cool places and i i didn't think of my i still i didn't think of myself as a composer it was mostly improvised i would like write the theme down and then the instruction would say over five minutes get sadder or something like that so i would i would do stuff like that and then no one understood that that was a distinction between composing and not composing and misunderstandings come, came up from it that actually ended up being beneficial because it forced me to take a look at those boundaries and to set them to the side and realize that actually composing was not that far off from something that i already could do next thing you know i was getting commissions i have a cello concerto i have a double concerto i have a quintet that i used to go around playing with the jack quartet um, other projects I'm, I'm composing right now I think what I take from that my own personal history and what I would like to share and impart is that a lot of these boundaries are artificial music is about expression and it's about play it's about discovery it's about sharing and if you just do that and and don't stop yourself you might end up accidentally composing because it's not it's not supposed to be that different so play with that play with what those boundaries are improvise um don't try to make it complicated it doesn't have to be beethoven don't try to be a beethoven composer don't be a composer just make music um and most of all don't feel like you have to always share that with other people do it for yourself if it starts to affect you in ways that make you need to share it you can do that in the meantime you don't have to 
just do it for yourself. Make it a part of your part of my warm up and and scale practice is like these weird things that just happen, and I don't even remember what they are, but it's become a very important part of my technical development, which was surprising, and it's been very beneficial. Um, you never know what will happen when you just start leaving room for creativity and not stopping yourself because you're starting to do something you don't know how to do. Just do it. Thank you so much for the inspirational words. Uh, yeah, and uh, I was wondering, um, do you usually write down the notes of whatever you're composing or do you, or do you just kind of leave it up to up to improvisation or mix of that or how was how's your process yeah good question so i do all of those um with the the first thing that i was i was telling you about yeah i, I actually would like i didn't want people to think i, I wasn't serious even though i would re like remember everything i have very good memory for music generally and, and that was trying to remember so i'd remember what i did uh, but I would write down the themes just so that people would see that I had done something. You know, like if the production manager or whatever walked over, they'd be like, oh, yeah, he's com he's composing. Um, but I would literally do I would literally just write like this needs to last five minutes and be sad by the end or like random stuff like that. And it would be basically the same and shift a little bit each time because I wanted it to. I didn't feel like I had found the thing that was set. The next year, I actually had my first um, like straight up commission where I had to write all of the notes down. And so I did. Um, but it was kind of similar in that I just like I would get to something and then eventually I'd be like, yeah, that's it. And then I would write it down. I wasn't like sitting down to write. However, once I started doing some chamber music and other things, I, I had to learn at a certain point because I didn't want to just be thinking cellistically through my fingers. I had to learn how to sit down, usually with a keyboard or piano, sometimes with nothing, and just think about music and write that way. Um, obviously, for concertos and quintets, you actually have to write notes. Um, maybe that's not obvious. Maybe you can do it without it. Some people do. But I, I wrote notes. And even the improvisatory sections are very specific because I had a specific idea about what I wanted. I've also done, this is one of my favorite things to do, um, a lot of multi-cello, multi-track cello composition where I just hit record and I never write anything down, but I just like listen, I just play and then I listen to what I played and I play something else with it. And then I go back and uh, like the com composition may take shape. I don't necessarily play one line the whole way through I might do one line for 30 seconds and then do another one with that and then something else and then that actually becomes the thing that continues for the next 30 seconds. It, it happens so many ways. And then eventually, as has been the case with a few of them, if I need to perform it with other people on, in a live performance, I'll go back and listen to it and write it down um, for them. But uh, before that, it's just a recording. That's it. That's, it. That's how I compose it. So. They all exist. They're all equally valid. In the end, the reason we write things down is because we are giving them to other people and they need to understand what to do. So however much is specific, you write it down. And if it's not specific, don't bother. And if it's just something for yourself and you don't need to write it down, write, write it down. If it's just something to be recorded, why write it down? Just record it. Just do what do what needs to be done for what you're doing, and don't worry about what the label is. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're getting close to a point where we need to wrap up. I was wondering if you had any final thoughts about practice, about creativity, about music, about life. Anything you would like to say? Yes. So coming back, um, and I think this will fit in to where we were just now, but coming back to the original thing that I had set out for this, which is managing practice effectively when you have a lot of things to do. You know, there are a lot of things, lots of ideas, all of this. What, what are the things that you can do that are most helpful? That's the question that I would ask. And 
Or ask people who do things in a way that you want to be able to do also, because if you haven't tried something, how would you know whether it's effective? And maybe it doesn't work for you, you can change it later. But that's the question. What is gonna move things forward for you the most? So I like to focus, no matter what I'm working on, I like to focus on basics. I like to focus on anything with the cello or with creativity that is going to help me have the attitude that is most focused, open, and aware so that whatever else I'm doing, whatever specific thing I'm working on or applying that to, it will have the best chance of being effective and of sticking uh, in me. And there's a lot of science behind that that I won't go into, but it's also something that you can feel if you start doing it. That means I play scales pretty much every day. Maybe not a ton, but like up to an hour, um, usually less. I improvise every day. I touch creativity. Um, even if it's just doing scales a different way and or like making up patterns, I do something creative on the cello every day. And I do my best to make sure that when I'm practicing music for performances, if I find something technically uh, that's a stretch or I find that I'm lacking in creativity or musicality or technique in some way, then I stop, I let that piece sit, and I go work on that other thing somewhere else. And I set limits on that, all of that, so that there develops this sort of trust that I know what I'm doing, that I can make good decisions. That's the big one with this relationship with the cello. And that I have a solid basis in the things that matter, in having something to say, in uh, having it be something that I care about and is interesting that I think and I hope other people are too and in being present and having the technique not only the physical technique but the practice how you practice technique to make sure that all those things merge together for the best performances the most present and convincing uh, self you can bring and that is that is the big thing for all of this is Whatever you need to do to make that happen, to feel solid in that, do the things that are most effective. Focus on the basics and do lots of run-throughs for people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, in my mind says, uh, hoping you can get time again one day to continue the Piatti series since you started on YouTube. It was so helpful. Many, best to you, Josh. Thank you. I hope so too. All right, so I think uh, this will uh, wrap up the general chat. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Joshua. And Thank I hope you. everyone out there in Cello that's, that's been watching the stream has been enjoying it. And I think Joshua had a lot of really insightful things to say. And I'll catch you in the next uh, Cello chat. I think the next one's going to happen on April 2nd. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>